today's topic, current cyber fraud trends, we'll begin now. About our webinars, uh, Fort Pitt Capital offers a series of, of webinars, just with a variety of topics, not just financial services related. Uh, we will give you or provide a couple of the topics later in our event. And uh, we do this as a, you know, a service to our clients. We love to bring together expertise. Uh, we will invite outside professionals such as attorneys, healthcare professionals, CPAs, and cybersecurity professionals uh, to these webinars to help educate and enlighten our clients. A little bit about me before we start. My name is Daryl Patton. I'm a senior vice president and financial consultant here at Fort Pitt Capital. Prior to Fort Pitt Capital, I spent 14 years at Charles Schwab and Company. I was a senior sales director of the firm and focused on investment theory, advice, and professional development. Uh, outside of Fort Pitt Capital, you'll probably find me in the bleachers watching one of my sons either playing baseball or basketball, and uh, we spend a lot of family time with them. Some quick housekeeping items, how to interact during the seminar or during the webinar. Uh, if you're on a device such as a phone or a tablet, follow the blue arrow to secure questions your questions and handouts in the bottom right hand portion of the screen. If you are using a computer, follow the blue arrow to find the pink orange arrow and that will unlock the questions and handouts portion of the application. Uh, handouts, according to the yellow arrow, will be mid-series. So there are handouts for the event. We'll give you a second to secure those handouts. And below, uh, we will have a question and answer session, a Q&A session. And uh, this is the section that you will use to forward questions that you have not so far. So I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Gary Rossi. Gary has spent over 30 years as a private sector and law enforcement security professional. He spent 14 years in federal law enforcement as a special agent with the FBI. He also served as the chief of the FBI's undercover and sensitive operations group and has extensive experience in financial and cyber fraud prevention. Gary has spent the past 17 years in Fidelity's global security and now leads the firm's security services group, which focuses ex exclusively on educating clients on security threats and prevention. Please welcome Gary Rossi. Thank you, Daryl, for the warm welcome. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Awesome, and hopefully see my screen as well. Give me the thumbs up, Daryl. Excellent. Well, I'm honored to spend time with you. I hope and pray everyone is staying as healthy as you can during an unprecedented times here. Thank you for welcoming me onto your computers and your home. And I'm really hoping that we can have an uplifting and empowering dialogue here. This is not about doom and gloom. I'm not here to scare you at all. What I'd really love to do today is add some calm and some perspective and speak from the lens of the adversary, the folks who are trying to come after our wealth, all right? So please tee up your questions. I'm gonna speak for about 25, 30 minutes or so primarily on cyber fraud, and I'm gonna hit it in three areas. I'm gonna talk first, who truly is the cyber adversary? Who's coming after us, all right? Then I'm gonna walk through one particular example that we're seeing a lot in the industry. We refer to this as an account takeover, an account compromise. Many of you have, may have heard pieces of this, but I wanna make sure everyone's on the same page on how this stuff actually happens. Some of that may get a little uncomfortable because how good they are at this, particularly in time of crisis, but don't worry. Four points, got your back, we have your back, we understand how they operate. I wanna spend the bulk of my time on really highlighting three key steps. There's many things you can do, but I'm a big believer in keeping it as simple as I can. I'm gonna share with you what I personally do. I've been in this business for a long time. These people target everyone, including me. I've been the victim of a breach. My family's been the victim of a cyber threat. Uh, so I'm gonna walk through, here's the top three things I do. They're proactive in nature, and most people don't take the time to do them which is why I'm so passionate about 
you want to make yourself a harder target so they move elsewhere okay and the reason i'm passionate about these sessions is it doesn't have to happen it's not that complicated and many of us i'm sure everyone on this call here you have many more important things to do than looking in the rearview mirror wondering about if these fraudsters are coming after you so that's really where i want to focus the time and answer your question so the material that um, you, you can download and hopefully you'll take the time to do this we have a comprehensive program that we refer to as personal security insights by far the most common thing we speak about is cyber fraud but i want you to know in the materials that you have we cover cyber fraud we cover digital footprint which does relate to cyber fraud as well as other things so i'm going to cover that as well and what i mean by digital footprint is what's online not just about you but your entire family and why is it important so i'm going to give you a couple key tips there because these adversaries they draw a circle not just around you but your entire family so when they're targeting and figuring out what fraud scheme to use so i want to make sure that you understand two things with that one what you put out for well-intended purposes on the internet whether it's social media or otherwise know that they can use that against you but two you want to have family consistency all right i'm going to spend a few minutes towards the end on a topic that's near and dear to my heart in my my career i spent 10 years as an undercover agent for the fbi i was able to ingratiate myself into the world of some sophisticated fraudsters if anyone saw the movie wolf of wall street or boiler room spent four years of my life becoming business partners with the people that run those operations i know how they operate i know how they think time is money for them they typically target those not just folks that are up on age but more so people that have some form of dementia or diminished capacity i'll give you a couple of tips there there's information on home safety and security and travel which we're not going to cover today all right let's jump right into it cyber fraud and this slide i'm going to leave up here for about 25 30 minutes and i don't have a ton of content i just want to frame the topics for you here so i'm not going to give you a i'll refer a death by powerpoint i really want to be conversational and the fraud schemes do change so i want to make sure you're aware of how they operate but first off who's coming after us okay the true adversary that i'd love for all of us to make sure we're educated on are for-profit economic criminals okay they are pretty sophisticated many of the people who are running these crime syndicates these fraud <laughs> rings most of them live overseas they live most of them in the former soviets in russia ukraine latvia lithuania estonia and they congregate on the dark web and they make a ton of money okay and they get involved in all kinds of different nefarious activities not just the cyber crime we're going to talk about they'll profit from all kinds of things running drugs on the internet pornography including child exploitation some get involved in murder for hire they'll stop at nothing a lot of them advertise and the reason it's important for you to understand who we see in the industry coming after your wealth and when i talk about your wealth here this afternoon i'm talking about your operating bank accounts and your investment accounts i'm not talking about credit cards today i view credit cards as important to monitor your activity typically you're going to get your money back but that's not where your wealth is they're, most often they're coming after where your true wealth is and that's what i'm going to get into and one thing I want to comment on, a lot of information that's in the press is about nation states, okay? And we're overwhelmed with a lot of data. And because of that, it's not that we don't do many things, but a lot of us have this strategy of hope. I hope it doesn't happen to me. Well, I want to change that uh, thought process if you haven't put in place some of the things we're going to talk about. And I'm going to under explain why. But one of the things I want to mention as far as the adversaries go, there's a lot of talk in the paper about the four main nation states who are incredible cyber adversaries but in my view that's no who i don't want you to worry about because that's not who we're seeing coming after individuals operating bank accounts and brokerage accounts particularly here in the u.s that's the people's republic of china the russian government the north korean government the iranian government more often than not they're coming after state secrets they're stealing intellectual property so take them off the table for now the true cyber adversaries who are sophisticated, they're just not up to that level of the nation states, are these for-profit criminals. And the reason that's an important to note is time is money for them. If you put up enough defenses, typically they're just gonna move elsewhere, okay? All right, so that's who the adversary is. It's these criminal forms. Most of the ringleaders are overseas. Yes, there's some US players. Yes, there's other players in West Africa and Asia, but most of the ringleaders that create these forms are in the former Soviets. They make a lot of money. There's different names of these groups. Some of you may have never heard of them. One group was called the In Fraud Organization. Fortunately, law enforcement took this organization down. Another group was called the Dark Market Group. This is where they trade their different schemes and data on all of us. 
Um, the, the in fraud group, they had 35, 36 people that were indicted. The ringleader was from Ukraine. Just to give you a sense of their scale, they made $500 million in the time they were operating. <clears throat> $500 million. They had a motto. Their motto was, in fraud we trust. Real nice of them. So, but know that in private industry and law enforcement, we study this stuff. They, they bring a lot of these folks to justice, but they do make a lot of money. And the thing here is, there's a lot of things that are done behind the scenes to protect you, but there's things that you can do that can stop this thing from happening. And I'm gonna get to that in a minute, but I wanna make sure I understand how these schemes work. So you know who the adversary is. How does it happen? The first scheme I wanna to talk to you about, and I just mentioned up here, they try to play you online. We refer to this as an account takeover or an account compromise. Okay, and this is happening not just in the U.S. but overseas. At a at a high level, this scheme has two steps. All right, and the two steps haven't changed in the time of the crisis. What's changed in the time of the crisis, and I'm going to get into a couple examples, is how how they're able to facilitate step one. They're able to facilitate it and, and make it happen a lot quicker. So step one is they want to steal your and my credentials. And when I say credentials, I mean your username and password. And this is something that you usually create. And they wanna steal your, your username and password for a few systems. The, the first systems that, that they wanna steal it for is where your wealth is, your operating bank accounts and your brokerage accounts. So they steal your username and passwords and they log in as you. I'm gonna come back to how they do that in a minute. The second step is the movement of money. They're gonna transfer your funds and my funds to accounts they control. And they set up accounts here in the US. They set up what we call third party accounts. They recruit people. And these people are referred to as money mules or they try to set up accounts in your actual name or my actual name. And it makes it easier for them to move the money because it's now a first party transaction. And then after they move it to accounts here in the US, then they quickly transfer them overseas to accounts they control over there. And they have these money mule networks and then eventually the money gets transferred to them and they profit from it. Those are the two steps, okay? Now, at the time of a crisis, this is where, and these people, this is not their first rodeo. They know many of us are working from home, a lot of us from the, you know, for the first time. They know we're distracted and we have this thirst for information. And by the way, these, these cyber criminals, they've been working from home most of their career. So they have this down to a science. They're very efficient and they have different specialty skill sets. And one of the specialty skill sets is referred to as the harvester. A harvester is someone who is harvesting credentials. Their job is to find the best and most efficient ways to steal your username and passwords, and they get paid for that. And they will do this hundreds and hundreds of times each week. And after they steal your username and password in mind, they're gonna log in to test to make sure they can get in, and they wanna see what the balance is because they get paid more based on the number of assets in those accounts. And these harvesters are very good. One of the, the best ways that they steal our username and passwords is through the use of malware or malicious software, okay? And they have this malware that's, it, we call it password capture malware or credential stealing malware. They have this malware that is, is written for all different types of devices. So one of the common things that I'd love for you to take away from today's discussion is prudent or good cyber hygiene. So whatever device that you or anyone in your family uses to log on to where your wealth is, and you can do it securely, and hopefully by the end of today, you'll have more affirmation of that. But they have this malware that is, that is written for mobile phones, okay? So smartphones, tablets, laptops. So any device you use, I would treat your smartphone as another powerful computer. So the same concept of prudent cyber hygiene, I'd love for you to take away on all the devices that you and your family use, all right? So they try to trick us to download malware. And if this malware gets on your device, some of this malware is, is pretty sophisticated. And it's not easy to detect. And some of it is very efficient. It lies dormant on the devices. And the only time it wakes up is if that computer is prompted to go to a financial service organization because the harvester, the coder who wrote this malicious software coded in you know, hundreds of financial institutions. So when it sees that the computer is going to say, www.b of a or wells fargo or fidelity that's when their code wakes up and it'll capture the next say 50 or 100 zeros and ones and it'll get sent over to you know you pick the name dimitri over in ukraine they're going to test to see if they can get in okay 
And now it doesn't matter how long or strong your password is, or if you just changed it yesterday, they're going to get your fresh password. So for today's, for, for today's argument's sake, assume that they're going to be able to steal your username and password and mine. They're that good at it. And particularly in a time of crisis, and this is how, how they take advantage of us. They create websites that look that they're legitimate, okay? And they trick us to go to these websites. And they trick us to go there um, to then execute something on their website, download a document, okay? Click on a picture, click on a link, and that sometimes will get us to download the malware. And I'm gonna take you back just, just for a couple of minutes so you know how sophisticated they've, they've always been and how they've refined their tactics. I'll take you back 15 years ago to Hurricane Katrina, just to make a point. Hurricane Katrina, uh, 15 years ago, two days before it hit ground, the cyber criminals, two full days before the storm hit New Orleans, they already had over 200 fraudulent websites set up. They registered the domains to make them look like they were relief organizations to help um, people you know, donate money to fight this and, and help the crisis of the Hurricane Katrina. 200 websites, tell you how seriously we take this. I sent two of my top people. I spent 10 years running the cyber crime group for the cyber fraud group for Fidelity. I sent two of my top people down to Pittsburgh in your great state. Why Pittsburgh? Well, Pittsburgh is the home, just so you have some pride on, on what they're doing in, in Pittsburgh, is the home of the National Cyber Forensic and Training Alliance, the NCFTA. I know that's a mouthful. That was created by one individual, Dan Larkin, who actually works at PNC Bank. Great mind, great mind, great man. And it was a it was a clearinghouse to bring academia, industry, and law enforcement to understand and fight cybercrime. And today there's so there's hundreds of companies, there's law enforcement agents from all over the international space, including the former Soviets that I mentioned, to fight this stuff. So I sent two people down there to understand how these, they're setting up these sites and help take it down. Well, fast forward to today, 15 years later, there's over 100,000 websites that they've set up that are related to COVID-19, tricking us to go download a document on uh, the coronavirus or download information on uh, the latest vaccine or download the information on the latest social distancing rules. So my point is don't be clicking on links and going to websites based on getting anything inbound via email or text message, because the bad guys know we have this thirst for information. And if you go to these one of these websites, which sometimes is not easy to detect as fraudulent, you, they may trick you to download malware. The more effective way, even besides going to websites, is they trick us via other inbound communications, particularly email and particularly text messages. And again, many of us are working from home and we have this thirst for information. Well, you're, I know, I know my family is buying all kinds of things on Amazon. I'll give you a couple quick examples here where you need to have your antennas up. If you get an email or a text message that says, track your package, do not click on that tab to track your package. They're emulating and making it look like these are legitimate emails coming from Amazon or whatever retail you're buying from, when in fact they've mirrored that and you click on that tab and now you're getting malware. If you're tracking a package, you go to FedEx, UPS, or whoever the delivery mechanism is and put in your tracking number. I'll give you one that's even more nasty than that. And I'm not trying to scare you. I just want you to give you, give you a sense of this is how they're getting malware on a lot of devices or tricking us to give them information. That's our username and password. And when, when they do it via text, um, it's pretty clear that more people will trust text messages than email. The message is getting out that these phishing emails are pretty common. So they're doing more and more text messaging. This is a text message and we call this smishing, SMS phishing. And they're easily able to get our cell phone numbers, okay? So don't think that they don't have your cell phone number or your email address or your property address. It's not hard for them to do a due diligence and get that. So let's say this text message came into my mobile phone. This is, this is a real smishing event. And this, is, this happened about a month ago. Someone who came in contact with you tested positive um, or has shown symptoms for COVID-19 and recommends you self-isolate and get tested. More at, and they put a link in there to get more information. So it's a contact tracing type text being sent. sent. That is a way they're downloading malware. Very nasty, could be on the vaccine. So my point is you have to have your antennas up on any inbound communication. If you're not expecting it, do not click on it. And in fact, even if you are expecting it, I would go to that website yourself 
or dial that number yourself. Do a little research instead of you clicking on things, okay? They do it with Zoom invites now. They're very, very good at it. And I'm gonna give you a way to better protect yourself. So if you do get that malware loaded on your machine, there's a good chance they're gonna get your username and password. Don't make it easy on them. The way that it's really easy on them is many people will use the same username and password for multiple things. So that's called password reuse. I highly recommend for any financial accounts and important accounts the bad guys wanna get into, create a unique username and password. That way, if there's a data breach, and the example I'll give you is, I have a LinkedIn account, I have a Merit Bonvoy account. Those are two entities among hundreds of companies that had data breaches. So LinkedIn had 110 million username and passwords that's out on the dark web for these criminal syndicates to use. To tell you a serious, we take this stuff, we took those 110 million username and passwords from LinkedIn and we tested it out. We bumped those up against our Fidelity network. We got into tens of thousands of our customer accounts because they use the same LinkedIn username and password as they did their Fidelity account. Of course, we shut those all down. We educated our clients and we you know, let them know you need to change your username and password. And you also do need to do something else to protect yourself, which is two-factor authentication, which I'm gonna to get to in a second. So you don't wanna reuse passwords for the important accounts. Use a unique username and password. So that's step one. Assume that they're gonna get your username and password. They log in as you and they play you online. Step two is they try to open up an account in your name. And it's not that hard for them to do. I'll give you a quick example. They'll be overseas. They'll go online to say B of A or Wells Fargo or PNC Bank. They'll hop off another computer so they're able to get onto the, the, the bank's website and they'll just click on open new account. They'll be presented with the profile page. And now what they do is they drop in your real information because it's very easy for them to get social security number, date of birth, et cetera, on all of us. And they'll put in their email when they're creating an account in your name so they're getting the statements, not you. Now this account gets opened up. Oftentimes you don't know about it. And now what they do is they log into your real accounts because they purchased your pat username and password from the harvester based on some of the methods I just described. And they don't do anything else in your real accounts because they don't want to trip any wires. Now they go to the account that they opened up, say at Wells Fargo, that's in your real name. And now they pull the money and they may do what they call an electronic funds transfer in EFT. They'll pull say $5,000. Same day, they'll pull $10,000. They may try to even do more money than that. And then within 24 hours, they've set up standing instructions on this account you don't know about to wire the funds overseas. Money gone. That's one of the ways they do that. I apologize to, for going into that much detail for those of you who have heard it, but most people I have this conversation with haven't heard of that, that level of detail. And the reason I gave that level of detail wasn't to depress you, but now I'm gonna give you the three things that I do personally that will stop this stuff from happening. And now you're gonna be able to connect the dots on how it's gonna stop it. First and foremost, if you can take anything away from this conversation today, please, please, please sign up for two-factor authentication in three systems. One, wherever your wealth is, contact your banks, contact your brokerage companies, and ask what do you have for a one-time password? So two-factor authentication, just to make sure everyone's crystal clear on what this means. Some people call this multi-factor. Some people call it two-step. I call it two-factor. The bottom line is it's a one-time password in addition to your initial username and passwords that the bad guys may have. So assume they have it, but it's an additional password that only works one time and it only lasts 30 seconds, okay? Many firms offer two methods. At Fidel, we offer two methods. You either can give us your mobile phone and we'll send you a text message. That's good. The better method, in my view, is a password authenticator. Many firms offer this as well. We have something called VIP access. We ask you to just load an application onto any device. I happen to load it onto my iPhone. It's a Norton's product. It's a very simple app. You put on any device and you hit that app and you get a six digit code. You're able to generate it yourself. Then you get into your account. It only takes a couple seconds once you sign up for this. We don't force this on people. Most companies don't because we wanna be customer service friendly. We don't have to use this, but I would highly recommend doing it. And here's why. The percentage of people who actually sign up for two-factor authentication is one or 2% in the industry. They've done all kinds of studies. I know the numbers at Fidelity and it's less than 2% of our clients actually sign up for this. A lot of people don't wanna take the time to do it because they don't understand how much it can help them. That's one of the reasons I do these sessions. 
the bad guys, think about it from the lens of the bad guy for a second, these harvesters, like I mentioned earlier, they're gonna test getting into your account because they wanna make sure that they are able to get in. So when they sell it, they, they're selling it to the next person in their organization. They're able to get in and they wanna know what the balance is. So they're gonna test getting in. They know what the numbers are. So if they go to test getting into your account and they see a box looking for a six digit code and they know the next 98 or 99 people, they're not gonna get that. More than likely, they're gonna take a pen and cross your name out, move on to the next person. That's what you wanna have happen. So in my view, and I, my dad will always be my hero. I grew up in Burlington, Vermont, about three hours north of here. He was a deer hunter. He taught me at a young age, Gary, you don't have to outrun the bear, but you need to do things that make yourself a harder target than your neighbors and anyone around you. I'm not saying trip your neighbors. What I'm saying is 99 or 98% of your neighbors aren't doing this. Do it, and the bad guy's gonna go elsewhere. You don't have to outrun the bear, but you need to use two-factor. You don't need to trust me, I hope you do, but I'll read you a, a quote from a criminal. He was recently arrested a couple months ago. His name's Kyle Milligan. He made millions of dollars in one of the ways he did through this scheme here. They asked him, he's trying to cooperate now and work off his sentence. They said, what was the one thing that would have stopped you from making your millions of dollars? You know what he told them? He said, enable two-factor authentication. So please do that. And I'm gonna give you two other systems as well. So wherever your wealth is, sign up for two-fact. It'll stop a lot of this nonsense. So you know you can live your lives, because trust me, if this happens, I spent a lot of time, as I mentioned, doing undercover work. These people, it's like a forced multiplier. Once they find a victim, then they start re-victimizing with other schemes. You can stop this stuff from happening, get your name crossed off list if you make it harder. The two other systems I'd love for you to use two-factor on. One, the second one, is your mobile phones. So I happen to have AT&T. Whether you have AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, whoever your phone provider is, I would log into your account. For me, I log into my AT&T account, or you can call them up. They're gonna authenticate you. Ask them for a two-factor code or a passcode so no one can make any changes to your mobile phone because these cyber criminals are smart. They know that we send text messages sometimes for two-factor. And they know we also call up and verify certain high-risk transactions. Well, if they're able to play you at your mobile phone provider, they can convince them to forward the phone to them or maybe even order a new SIM card. That's how they beat two-factor authentication if you're using uh, SMS to get your codes. You can protect that by getting two-factor on your mobile phone. So please do that. The third system is your email. This is a whole different scheme. And we don't have a lot of time to go into the details, but I'll give you one quick example. Please use two-factor authentication to protect your personal emails. And by the way, if anyone wants to learn more about the schemes, particular to coronavirus or just regular cyber fraud schemes, a couple places you can go, and it's in that brochure that uh, hopefully you've downloaded. You can go to the fbi.gov backslash coronavirus, you know, section of the websites, or fbi.gov backslash scans and safety. Or another organization, which the gentleman that I mentioned before is from Pittsburgh created, is the Internet Crime Complaint Center. It's I, C, Charlie, the number three, dot gov. And you can actually lodge complaints, and there's information there on different scams. And the one I'm going to tell you about is called the email account compromise. Some people refer to this as the business email compromise. If you just happen to Google that, you'll find out that the, the crime loss stats, the cybercrime losses, related to the business email compromise and the email account compromise is the most profitable right now. It's into the billions. It's actually 20 billion over the last three years worldwide. And here's how it works. They wanna be able to read your and my email. And the reason they wanna read our email is for a few reasons, but one is so they can monetize and get in the middle of a transaction that you and I are talking about in our email. So many people use email to talk about sensitive things. I'll just use me as an example. I happen to have a web-based email account. It's a Gmail account with Google. Wherever you have your email accounts, wherever your family has their email accounts, these bad guys, oftentimes they buy uh, reused passwords from the data breaches, say LinkedIn or Marriott Bonvoy that I mentioned earlier. And they have my Gmail account because they just did a little due diligence on me. And what they do is they'll take the LinkedIn username and passwords and they bump them up against my email because many of us, don't even remember what we use to set up our email account as far as a username and password. And many of us use the same username and password combination. 
and they have playbooks and all this stuff. So what they do is they'll run the LinkedIn username and passwords against my Gmail account. Fortunately, I have a unique username and password for my Gmail, so it's not gonna work for them. But hypothetically, many people do. And if they were able to get into my Gmail account, what they do is they automatically go right to my account settings. And then they write a rule. They write a rule to transfer all my email to them. And they're very efficient. Again, they have playbooks on this. They'll run a keyword search to see about what are some transactions I may be talking about. They may put in their real estate attorney or real estate agent, okay? Now they'll find out, hypothetically, I own a condo down in Cape Cod and I own it with my brother, Ron. Well, they did this keyword search for escrow agent and now up pops the email between my escrow agent and me that says, closing is tomorrow, here's the closing docs. Now they know there's a sale going down on this condo, $500,000 for this condo. And what they do is they log into my email account and they can log into any web-based email account from any computer in the world if they have your username and password. And now they send an email and they write it exactly like me because they've read my emails. They're very good at it, even though they speak a different language. And they'll type an email to my escrow agent saying, hey, I own this property 50-50 with my brother, Ron. We set up a separate account to segregate these funds. Here's that account, please wire the proceeds here. Now that escrow agent at best may call me up on my mobile or send me an email and say, is this you? Well, if the bad guy has transferred my phone or is intercepting email, they're gonna confirm that. Now that money goes to this account, the real Gary Ross had no idea was set up. Within 25 hours, the money's over in Asia somewhere, money gone. Good luck getting that back. The way you can protect that is very simple. Two things, in your email account, go to your settings and change your username and password to something unique. That way, if there was a data breach, you're gonna be protected. And more importantly, double down and use two-factor authentication. With Gmail, as with many other web mails, you can sign up for, so when I log into my email account, I hit that M, I don't get right in. I have to hit a button and it gives me a two-digit code, then I get in. And if someone tries to log into my Gmail account, there's a feature in there, there's alert, where I'll get alert if someone's trying to log into my email, so that's an additional uh, feature. Two-factor, by far the most important thing to take away from today. Second thing I'd love for you to consider, please consider putting a security freeze, all right, with the three major credit bureaus. Easy to do, it's free, it's permanent. You need to go to all three separately, it's easy, and go online now, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. Just log on, it's very prominent on their websites where you can place a security freeze. You need to do this as an individual. This isn't something you can pay someone to do. You'll get a pin from all three of them. That way, if you have to unlock your credit, it's easy to do. The reason I like people to consider doing this is this will proactively prevent the criminal from opening accounts up in your name. So that example that I gave you a few minutes ago where the bad guy logged into say, Wells Fargo to try to create an account in your name. Wells Fargo, just like every financial institution here in the US, by law, it's part of the Bank Secrecy Act, US Patriot Act, we call it the know your customer rule. So before that situation that the bad guy tried to log in to open that account up, before Wells Fargo can authorize that account, they have to check in their backend systems with one of the three credit bureaus to make sure they have to check four things, name, address, date of birth, so. so they have to make sure you're a real individual and you know, you're not on any terrorist watch list, et cetera. If you've frozen your credit, that bank can't do it. How nice is that? You can stop that from happening by simply freezing your credit. Most people don't realize how well that can protect you. And it's much easier for them to move money. The last thing I'm gonna spend time on telling you, so if you do these things in that order, you're gonna be much better off. The third thing you don't have to do, but I like to give people, in my mind anyway, um, I like to give people an option to have at least one computer in your household that you have a high degree of confidence doesn't have any malware on it. Because there's other malware other than that password capture malware that we talked about. I like people to consider using a separate device. I refer to it as my clean machine. So it doesn't matter to me the type of device. What matters is, is buy a new one. They're not that expensive anymore. I happen to use an iPad. And uh, you know my son, God love me, he's an artist in New York City now. Recently graduated from college, got the biggest raise of my life. I just took his last, I think we paid for a new computer every semester. I just took his last one, wiped it clean, erased it to the factory settings and used that one. Um, if you're gonna do that, make sure you back it up first, uh, if you have any photos or whatever. But in any event, my wife and I use this iPad. 
to log into our operating bank accounts and our brokerage accounts. Most of us happen to be at home, particularly now. Most people are domiciled in one place. So the bulk of the transactions that we do are with this clean machine. And the key is we don't do the two things that would expose us to getting malware with it. The two main ways these bad guys are the most successful in getting us to download malware, one is web surfing. You know, all these hundreds and thousands of websites they control. We never do any web surfing with that device, ever, full stop. We use a different device to shop Amazon, surf the web, go on the social media. And the second thing, and equally, if not more importantly, we never do email, ever. We use a different device to do email because the way in which they create these very diabolical phishing emails, they're very good. They do what some people refer to as spear phishing. The spear is the, uh, you know, is the email going at the big fish, right? They'll find out something very personal about you and I, where our kids go to school, our grandkids, what our favorite charity is, and they'll create an email that looks like it's coming from something that's very personal to us and may more apt to click on a, a document or a photo, and now we're getting malware. Well, if I don't ever do email with that device, at least that device is not gonna get malware, and that's the device I primarily use to log into my wealth. So something to think about. It's not a new concept, but most people don't take the time to do it. Those are the three things that I do personally that most people I find don't do. This last bullet, which is in your material, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, are the more common things people do, which are good to do, and this is good cyber hygiene, but I like to do the top three in addition to those to make yourself a harder target. Daryl, I'm gonna pause here in a minute, but I wanna make a couple comments for the first wave of question on digital footprint before we take the first round of questions. All right, so I mentioned in, in, the, uh, in the, my introductory remarks, Digital footprint is what's online about you and your family and why is it important? And I'm not trying to dissuade you from using social media. In fact, the opposite. I would never, fortunately my dad's still with us, I would never take that away from him. He loves to go on Facebook and see pictures of his kids and grandkids. He loves to text and all. So he's very active in the things he wants to do. You can do it much more safely if you take advantage. I'm gonna get right to the strategies here. I'm gonna highlight two of them take advantage of the privacy settings on whatever social media you're using. You can use two-factor authentication to protect anyone from making changes, okay? But the two themes here that I'd love for you to take away is what you put online for well-intended purposes. So let's say you have a bio that's out there on LinkedIn or you're on the board of some charity. That's all awesome. But a lot of times we put a lot of personal information in there, which is okay if you wanna do that. I would limit that. But what you put online for well-intended purposes, the bad guys will use it against it. So understand it and protect it. You can hire someone to do what's called a digital footprint analysis that will give you a point in time snapshot on how you and your family looks online. That way you can just be aware. So that's point one. Point two is get everyone on the same page. So this is what I refer to as family consistency because you may have one person in the family that has this low profile. I hear that a lot for people in our generation. Oh, I'm not gonna get on social media and I have this low profile. Well, that's all well and good. Don't do that to, you know, because of the bad guy. Some people aren't comfortable, that's great. But if you have that level of discretion, but then say your spouse, your kid, or your grandkids, if you have them, have a different level of discretion, you're just as exposed. So I like people to have a family conversation on how you're gonna operate in the, in the cyber world. So. In any event, I'm going to pause right there, Daryl, and I'm going to come back and cover one other point topic after the first wave of questions. That sounded all right? Sounds great, Gary. Thank you. Why don't we get us on here so they can see us better? There we go. What do we got for questions? Well, let's start with the first question. With all sites, Requesting two to three security questions along with the user name or password. Is there an entity, government or otherwise, cross-referencing the data to build a complete database or person with one relationship? I can repeat that question if you'd like. Yeah, no, that's okay. I, I think I understand. I'm not aware that there is one database uh, for that. So that's a great question. Um, I'm not aware of that. Um, that is definitely an area that uh, we refer to those as challenge questions in the industry. So if you're using the phone channel of your banks or your brokerage companies, um, those questions are getting harder and harder because the bad guy can, can do their due diligence. They'll go to a lot of different 
uh, what we call data aggregators to get information on, you know, mother's maiden name and, you know, car information and whatnot. So those are getting harder and harder. Um, so um, I think those challenge questions can be good if they're getting more and more unique, which they are, but sometimes those are <laughs> difficult to remember. So you have to have some way to, uh, when you do choose, if, you, if you're given the opportunity to choose your challenge questions, you have to keep those, keep track of them. I'm actually a fan, Daryl, the technology on voice biometrics is much better. So, and I can only speak for Fidelity, but many entities will allow you to use your voice as your password. So you don't have to do these challenge questions. You have to, you know, sometimes if you're going into a, a phone channel, you got to type in your username and password and get, and that gets a little bit funky and then answer these security questions. I'd recommend signing up for the voice biometrics. We waited a while to adopt ours. We call it Fidelity My Voice. It's actually not a recording it's a voice print. So it's a digitized algorithm of your voice. And we actually keep track of the bad guy voices. That way we'll get those from law enforcement or we'll have stopped the fraud because they will emulate, try to emulate us on the, you on the phone as our customer. So I would sign up for voice biometrics. And one point there, um, a lot of people have a misconception. Let's say you're not using the phone channel of your bank or of you know entity like Fidelity. You have the ability to work with Daryl, you and your great team, and do it more in person or on, on the phone directly. Well, it's equally, if not more importantly, to still take advantage of the security features at those institutions, because you may not use it on a regular basis, but the bad guy will try it. So set those security features you know, online and on the phone. That way, I mean, you're very likely you get your money back, and we all have fraud guarantees, but to me, it's not so much the economics. It's about the colossal pain in the backside to have to unwind these frauds. And if anyone on this call has gone through a true identity theft, it follows you for years. So you want to set up these security features so they just go elsewhere. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that insight. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Next question. Any recommendations on how to best keep track of all my passwords? And how do you feel about password managers or password vaults? Great. I'm glad that was brought up. I'm a big fan of password managers. I'll just speak right to that. Many of us in the industry, when we think about your credentials, which obviously is a huge part of what I just talked about, we think about it in three ways. First is use a unique username and password for your important accounts. We already talked about that. Two, use two-factor. And the third, which is very important, is have an efficient and a secure way to store them. I like password managers. I use, I use one myself. I'm not trying to sell a particular one. I use LastPass, but there's many other ones. If you're gonna research it, I would simply you know, put into Google PC Magazine Password Manager, and you'll come up with, they do a consumer report type study. Pick one that's highly rated. And the key, Daryl, is use their security features. So when I use my LastPass, I have a master password and I have it on my phone. It's a unique master password. And the next thing I use is two-factor authentication. I don't get right into my password manager because I put in my initial username and password. I assume I may have malware on that, that phone that I'm using. So I have to hit a button, I get a six-digit code, then I'm in, and it's much more secure. So that way you can keep track much better of the 50 or 100 different username and passwords that we're all trying to keep track of. And my last point on the, the password managers, I like to think worst case scenario, Let's say whatever method, Daryl, you use to, to keep track of your password. Some people put them on a thumb drive. Some people put them on a Word doc or an Excel spreadsheet and encrypt it. Some people use a password manager like me. Let's say the bad guy's able to breach that. Not a good thing, but you know what? If you're using two-factor authentication on where your important counts are, like we talked about, how are they gonna get into that? You can't store two-factor authentication in a password manager or on a document. So, that's why that's the number one thing I try to talk about. But using a password manager or whatever method to organize it and keep track of all this stuff is a very smart thing to do. That way you can have more unique username and passwords. Great, great tip and wonderful advice. Thank you, thank you. Our next question, how effective are antivirus software, spyware, and how do, do I really need them? So short answer is yes, that's good digital hygiene to use what's available out there in the industry. Pick a reputable antivirus spyware um, solution that's available for all your devices, in my view. That will be able to catch and prevent, you know, it's, it's a high percentage. I, no one can tell you the exact, whether it's 80, 90%, but it's gonna catch a lot of what's out there, okay? 
but you can't, that isn't a panacea though. It's much like the flu shot. The best analogy I can give you is, you know, obviously the flu shot's not gonna prevent all the diseases out there. That's similar to antivirus. And think about it from the bad guy's perspective for a second. The ones who are these good harvesters or these coders, they're gonna have a test computer and they're gonna buy the same protective measures that are available to us. They're gonna put malware bytes and Nortons and you know, McAfee, and they're gonna test their code. And once they know it gets caught, they're gonna change it because it's usually signature based and then they have a new version of their malware. So my point is there's usually a week, two weeks, sometimes longer before the industry um, is, is catching it. So it's good to stop a lot of it, but you can't use that as the only thing, which is why I don't list that as, as the, you know, one of the top ones. If you're using two-factor, you're gonna be much better off, but you still should use it. It's good, good digital hygiene. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, question online, how secure are phones that use face views to verify? So the way I look at, that's a, in a, in another good question. So thanks for that, whoever asked it. So um, I'll, I'll refer to that as a biometric. So, you know, many of us use the thumb oftentimes on your devices. Now a lot of people are using the face. I think that can be very good, but the way I look at it is that will protect my device if I lose it or it gets stolen, okay? It's, in, it's, it's just much, it, it's harder to, you know, it's easier to, to to figure out a four digit code than it is a face or a thumb, all right? And I'm not saying it's 100%, but it, the biometrics are a better level, I think, to protect the phone. But some people like me will use the face or the thumb for convenience to log into certain accounts. So when I'm logging into my Fidelity account, I use my face and what's happening there is, and we're leveraging the technology that's on the phone where my actual real username and password is stored on the phone. So Fidelity or anyone else, and a lot of firms will, will use this, Fidelity is not getting my face, Fidelity is getting my real username and password. So if there's malware on that device, well, Dimitri is getting my real username and password because I'm using my face. It's just like I'm typing it in. So because you're using your face or thumb, don't view that as two-factor authentication to log in. You still need to use you know, the text message or the password authenticator. So that biometric is really, really for convenience, but it is a good, security tool to protect the device for what I mentioned earlier. Hopefully that's helpful. Wonderful, Wonderful. I'm sure it is. Thank you so much. Uh, another question from one of our online participants. Are third party mm -hmm. online security companies worth it? The ones that promise to keep you safe from having identity stolen? So I have a lot to say on this one and it's not all bad. Um, I, I think you need to put those in perspective. So there's many firms out there that advertise very well. I would just do your re research before you pay someone regular. I mean, they don't usually charge that much money, but I would do a little research on what their practices are. I would just type in the name of that firm and on Google and then put in regulatory fines or regulatory action just to kind of see what their reputation is. I'm not saying they're bad, but for me, that's more the suspenders than it is the belt. I wouldn't use that as my first line of defense. I do some research and I've tested out a number of them. I was part of a data breach when I was, you know, I was part of the government, as you know. So there's, there was the OPM breach and I was offered one that I tested out. My experience has been, some of them are very good, but oftentimes they're telling you about something bad that's already happened and then you have to unwind it. So for me, I would first go to your banks and your investment companies and leverage the alerts that they offer you. Like a lot of these monitoring services are more like an alert service. Well, before you pay them, I would go to your banks because they already have your data, they already have your wealth and your, your, your financial firms because we offer a number of different, uh, you can get a text message or email someone's change your profile or trading stock or moving money. So I would leverage those first. And as far as like the insurance, sometimes they'll offer insurance. Well, I would find out what's the fraud guarantee of the actual institutions that have your wealth first, rather than pay some third party. So I, would, I wouldn't do that as the first step, but they, they can be somewhat effective, but I would just put them in perspective. And the last thing I'll mention, since it was brought up, a lot of them advertise that they're gonna surf the dark web, all right, and, and find if there's any of your personal information out there. What does that mean, really? All right, I don't like to put a lot of credence in that. Yes, they may be able to get in some of these forms, but I can guarantee you they're not getting into all the forums because there's so many out there. So I wouldn't put a lot of weight that they're getting into every one of them. So I would do the things we talked about. 
And Daryl, if you don't mind, I'm gonna try to share my screen again. I just wanna hit a couple points on one other topic and then come back to the, the Q&A if you don't mind. Absolutely. All right? Let me Absolutely. see if I can uh, show my screen here again. Okay, no, I don't wanna do that. There we go. You see my screen again? Yes, we can. Beautiful. So this topic here, I've found in my career that most of us have a relative, a neighbor, a friend, maybe even a family member that's targeted more, not just based on age, but sometimes based on uh, some form of dementia or diminished capacity, or you're in a scenario now where you may be more vulnerable that you lost a spouse. Well, I can tell you firsthand, these fraudsters are so good at ingratiating themselves into someone that's in this demographic. So a couple things to think about here. Um, these fraudsters typically don't try to take the money in one, one um, transaction. Usually they do it over time, so you have a chance to catch it. So in my view, I'll just get right to the key strategies. I would, if you're looking after anyone in this category, I would sign up for the AARP's Fraud Watch Network. They do a great job of putting out information on the latest scams, and they do it by, by region. And some of the scams haven't changed that much over time, but a lot of times people aren't focusing on it until they're in this, uh, in this scenario. So one of them is a romance scam where someone has recently lost a spouse and they ingratiate themselves over a period of time. And they come up with these very believable scenarios to get this individual, what we used to call under their ether, okay? They're so good at it. So trust me, it happens more than people think. So I would prioritize the conversation. You don't have to take away trading authority or their ability to, to, to do any sort of financial transactions, but I like people to pick at least one person, ideally two, to get view access into these accounts and sign up for alerts. That way you can get some information maybe once a, a, a month or once a quarter to look at these accounts to see if there's any suspicious activity so you can stop this stuff from happening. And with coronavirus now, there's all kinds of different charity schemes out there. I'm trying to help someone who's a, who's a friend of mine who's a teacher. Their mom was convinced that their grandson was stricken with COVID. They needed $200,000 to buy medical equipment. Unfortunately, the fraudster actually went to their house, played the role of a bank employee, and they actually were able to convince them to send $200,000. It's overseas. We're still trying to help get the money back, not even a Philly client. So they're, they're leveraging coronavirus quite a bit in, in this scenario. I'll give you one quick other example. I made these same comments about monitoring the accounts. This was at an in-person luncheon about a year and a half ago in Kansas City. Individual left the luncheon, called his brother up and said, hey, have you checked mom's accounts recently? He said, dang, I haven't checked them in two years. Well, what ended up happening was, fortunately they had access, but they just weren't paying attention to him. Well, this woman was, she was part of the, a fraud ring, following a playbook, she ingratiated herself into their mom's you know, home care team. Took her a few years to do it. She convinced their mom, got her under her ether, to change her to be a beneficiary on a life insurance policy, and worse, was able to get um, added as an authorized signer on her operating bank account. She convinced her that, hey, I'll help you pay the bills, et cetera, et cetera. They went to the bank that same day. There were wire instructions for $300,000 to move out of their account, and they stopped it. This stuff happens more than people think. So my point is just have some tripwires in there to monitor it, and you can, uh, you can prevent it from happening. All right, I will, I'll, I'll pause there and let's go back to some, uh, some questions. And I'm happy to stay past the top of the hour. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time, but I'm happy to answer as many questions as people, people have. Great, thanks. Maybe a follow-up question, uh, Gary. Thank you for the sure. insight. Mm -hmm. um, if you are, you know, a, a, if you do have a security breach, what, what should you do yeah. immediately Sure. that you experience a breach? Couple things, and I've got some information there in that security guide. So there's the Identity Theft Assistance Center that has a whole bunch of different checklists you can use depending on the type of the identity theft. But I would immediately contact your, your financial institutions, your advisor that you're dealing with, wherever your wealth is, so they can, um, you know, you have to act quickly if they're gonna have a chance to get some of this money back oftentimes. So I'd contact them. I would go to the Internet Crime Complaint Center, ic3.gov. That's a great way. There's a one page um, form that you can submit any particular attempt. And they're very, very good now. They have something that they have a network in place where every economic crime um, squad of the FBI is tied into real time this IC3, where if you put in this complaint, 
it automatically would go to that jurisdiction and they can they have arrangements with banks both here in the US and domestically to help uh, try to recover those funds and and they'll get to the right place it's also helpful to report to your local police um, as well so you can file a you know a police report that may help with you know any particular record of of the situation so there's a there's a few things there you can do great but Gary, i would do so i would do what we talked about first the two-factor freeze your credit <laughs> and there's a good chance you don't have to go through that because that process is it's not fun to go through i'm not saying it can't be helpful but i'm trying to prevent people to have to go through that stuff great why don't we take one last question um, could you explain, this is a follow-up question from an earlier comment, an earlier topic. Could you explain in more detail what a password authenticator app is and exactly how it works? Sure. And let me see if I can do it with, uh, with my phone. So there's, there's not one password authenticator out there yet. So unfortunately, there's many of them out there. I have an actual folder on my phone. So if, if you can see it, I've got a folder. I call it my authenticators. Okay. I'll hit that button. So at Fidelity, we use something called VIP Access. It's a Norton's uh, semantic product. So all I did was I went to the App Store. Um, I have an Apple phone, so at the Apple App Store, I just put in VIP Access, and that comes up and I download the app, okay? And then to activate it, you just need to place one phone call you know, to the institution. And so in this case, you call Fidelity up and say, I'd like to activate VIP Access. They'll say, great, you know, after they make sure they're talking to the real customer. They're, then what happens is they'll say, what's the credential number on the app? So all you do is you hit this app and up pops, there's a, a long number here, the credential number, that that is what ties your accounts, whoever has access to your accounts, that credential number, now this app will work. So then when I log into my Fidelity account from any computer in the world, I put in my real username and password, but assume the bad guy has it, then what happens is I'm going to get a box that looks for a six-digit code. So all I have to do is have my phone with me. I hit that, I hit the button, and this code quickly pops up. It's a six-digit code that only lasts 30 seconds. I pump that in, and I'm in. You can actually cut and paste it if I'm logging in from the phone. And the reason this is so effective, worst case scenario, Daryl, let's say the, the, the bad guy is on your computer and he's watching it, right? This is worst case scenario. You've already put in your code to get into the account. Even if he captures that code, it's not going to work for them because it only works once. You've already logged in. These password authenticators are, are, are a very effective uh, tool, so I'd, I'd leverage them. Excellent. Excellent information. Gary, thank you so much. Um, as a reminder, if you've joined our call late, um, I am showing you on your interface where to find Gary's handouts. Uh, you're more than welcome to download the handouts and print them out uh, for future reference. Um, also, upcoming webinars. Uh, we have two webinars uh, upcoming May 6th and May 18th. So again, off topic notes. Um, so please stay tuned for those webinars. Um, and last but not least, and again, I'll, I'm gonna come back to Gary, is we, will, we are having, Fort Pitt is having a shred event here at the firm in conjunction with data security may 14th from 11 30 a.m to 1 30 p.m so please um this is open to clients non-clients as well as, as a participant of this webinar if you have secure information and would love to have that information shredded please show up at foster plaza 10 680 anderson drive between the hours of 11 30 a.m and 1.30 p.m., and we'd be happy to help you take care of shredding. So, before we end today, Gary, I just wanna take a, a minute, and uh, you know, from us at Fort Pitt Capital to, to you and, and our partners at Fidelity, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful hour of material and presentation, and thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I know I personally, uh, mm -hmm. gleaned a lot of information from this. We do this a lot here at the firm, and there were still topics that you covered today that I found very helpful and insightful. I'm sure the folks who participated uh, found the same. So again, thank you for your My time. Pleasure. My and pleasure. thank you for your expertise. My pleasure. Stay safe. Don't let these bad guys bother you. They're not that smart. <laughs> Take the time to do a couple of things. You'll be fine. Be well. A little pre-planning pre and a little diligent sounds like it goes a long way.
You got so, it. Gary, Gary, thank you so much. You. We will let you end the call. Um, again, thank you to everyone for joining us today. And before we sign off, I want to make sure you see and read the disclosure and disclaimers. And again, look for our next web events upcoming shortly. And we look to uh, look forward to having you again at uh, one of our next events. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye now. Bye, Gary. Thank you.